In this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to use a Mental Ray color mix node with Mental Ray um, Mental Images Basics or MIB shaders uh, to create a layered shader for a paint can here. So the elements that we're going to address here are the underlying can, which is a metallic shader that has a, uh, a reflection on it. Then the next layer is going to be a label, which has a completely different specular highlight. Uh, and it has some uh, reflection, but the reflectivity is um, substantially lower. And then a third layer of dripping paint, which has a bump map or uh, multiple bump maps on it to give it not only the dimension and the thickness of the paint, but also some texture on the paint. Uh, so uh, that's what our goal is, and it should be about three or four different steps. And, um, you know, that's what we're going to demonstrate. So. So to begin with, I have my uh, model of a paint can, which is really just a simple revolve. And I have uh, two or three lights around it. And for, for now, I just have a regular Maya Lambert material on there. So it doesn't matter if I render this in Maya or Mental Ray. I'm still just going to see this Lambert material. Uh, one of the things that we want to notice here is that when I plug in the uh, input, when I show the input and output connections, uh, you can see that the uh, information contained in the Lambert material is fed to the shading group node. Now we've had some experience with the shading group node. Um, typically we'll use this to apply the displacement material, but um, when I look at the inputs and the outputs, notice that the um, the revolved surface shape also feeds into this shading group. So it's really within this shading group here that the association between the material and the surface is made. Um, down below in the attribute editor, there's a little custom shaders um, uh, rollout under the mental ray section. And you can see there's another slot here for a material shader. In the absence of a um, a material shader here, Mental Ray will default to the Lambert material because Mental Ray can understand all of the Maya, uh, the Maya shaders. So what we want to do is start using some of the Mental Ray surface materials which would be plugged into this slot right here. So the first material that I'm going to use here uh, is a, a metallic surface. Uh, so I think I'm going to use a um, uh, a Cook Torrance material. Uh, the Cook Torrance uh, is a material in Mental Ray that has a, um, a, a specular highlight that respects um, an index of refraction and uh, is made brighter or uh, dimmer based on the angle of view. So it's a very physically accurate shader. So I can either um, assign this directly to my um, to my can here or I can just drag this and bring this over to the material shader that's associated with the shading group that's already applied here. And when I do that, uh, rendering in Mental Ray will, uh, will show the Cook Torrance shader. And if I change my, my renderer to the Maya software, it will show me my Lambert. So that's, um, uh, that's just a convenient way of of uh, making this kind of an association. So here we have the surface feeding into the um, shading group, the Lambert feeding into the Maya section of the shading group. So if we render in Maya, those two become associated. And then uh, we have the Cook Torrance feeding into the Mental Ray section so that um, these two will become associated in there if we render in Mental Ray. So what we're missing here uh, is well, let's talk about what we've got here first. Uh, what we have here is uh, the four main components of a Mental Ray basic specular shader, which is the ambience and the ambient. I'm going to drop those both down to zero because I don't want to be self-illuminating here. We have the diffuse and the specular, which we know from uh, previous videos should not add up to anything more uh, greater than one. Uh, I have a roughness factor, which will spread out my um, specular highlight. And then I have a separate index of refraction for each channel, red, green, and blue. Uh, so I'll, um, uh, I'll increase this a little bit. I want to bias this a little bit over to the blue side. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm going to, um, um, I'll, I'll finish my layered shader, and then I'll come back and I'll make some adjustments. So the one thing that we're missing is any sort of reflection. 
uh, first of all, we have nothing to reflect, and second of all, we have no component with which to reflect it. So let's start with the first part. Uh, there are various ways that I can force a reflection in Maya. I can either use a ray trace reflection and reflect whatever else is in my scene, or I can use an environmental reflection. I'm going to go ahead and use a, an environmental reflection. Um, I'll open up um, my in indirect lighting section of my mental ray render settings, and I'm going to create an IBL node. Uh, the IBL node um, presents a sphere uh, around my my um, uh, around my model, and then I, I map an image on the inside of that sphere, and it can show up as a either a, a, an environmental background or a reflection or both. Uh, within the sphere attribute editor, I can click on the image name here. It brings me to my um, uh, my source images directory, where I have a number of spherical reflection maps um, already uh, created in here. So I'll just create. I'll just take this blue um, spherical map and I'll map that to the inside of that sphere. Uh, so when I render, I can see that that's now my background, but I'm still not reflecting it because I, you know, as I said before, I don't have a, um, um, I don't have any component that will give me that kind of reflection. So in the hypershade window, um, I can go into the mental ray rollout here, and under the sample compositing section, I have an MIB reflect node. And this is the component of a shader tree that will allow me to create reflections uh, on a surface. So the way that this works is that this has to be the downstream node here in my uh, shading tree. So I'll go into the shading group here, under the material shader where I have the Cook Torrance, I'm going to replace that with my reflection node. The reflection node then has an input and a reflectance. So the input, the reflection node, all it does is it purely reflects. And any diffuse, any specular uh, uh, highlight, any refraction or anything like that is going to be controlled by whatever I plug into the input section. So I'll drag my Cook Torrance to the input section, my reflectance is at about 50%. And I don't really have to do any um, reassignment here because my surface is already respecting uh, whatever is plugged into the, um, uh, this, the shading group node. So I can go ahead and, and, uh, and render this. And now you can see that I have a, uh, a highly reflective um, uh, chrome-like can. Uh, what this what this uh, reflection shader will do is it will balance whatever diffuse I have in the Cook Torrance material with the amount of reflectance. So if I drag the reflectance all the way down, uh, we'll see that I'm just going to see the diffuse attribute and very, very little reflection on there. If I bring this all the way up to 1, my diffuse and specular typically uh, will just completely go away, and I'll just get a purely reflective, high-polished chrome uh, material. So this is a good material for my first layer. One more thing that I want to do, though, is I want my reflection to be angle-dependent. So we know how to do that uh, using Maya Utility Nodes. In the Utilities here, I'm going to select a um, Sampler Info node here. And I'll select a 2D ramp. And just so that I can keep track of what I'm doing, I'm also going to use a, um, uh, a surface shader. Uh, initially, so I can see what the um, uh, what the uh, what my ramp is doing. So I'll I'll drag the ramp to the default um, color of the surface shader, and you can see how the mat the ramp wraps around there. I'll take the sampler info, drag it on top of the um, of the ramp, and connect the facing ratio to the v coordinate. And you can see that my map, my the colors of my ramp are now mapped based on uh, the angle of the normal. So because this is going to be reflectivity and I want it to be less reflective where it's facing me, I'll take this blue color and I'll make that a, uh, a dark gray. I'll eliminate the green and the red, which is going to be around the outside. I want that to be um, you know, a lighter gray so that I have a little bit more reflectance around the outside. 
So once I've used this surface shader to determine how that's going to map on, I don't need it anymore, but I'll, um, I'll drag this ramp onto the reflect attribute then of my, um, of my reflect shader. And you can see then that um, I have less reflectivity where we're facing the can and more where we're away from the can. So that takes care of step one. That's the, uh, the, first, um, the first layer that we want to create um, in our uh, layered shader tree. In order to layer these, we need another node. Um, the mental ray section down here, we have a data conversion section. And in there, we have an MIB color mix node. The color mix node uh, allows us to composite several layers uh, in one shader. Uh, we start off with a color base, which is down here at the bottom. And then we can add eight different layers on top of that. So that goes from uh, zero. Uh, through seven. Each one of those layers then we can map the transparency by uh, mapping something to the weight. Uh, and then we can further choose what our composite flag is going to be. So we have a lot of filters that are like Photoshop and blend and mix and add and multiply and so forth. And then finally we have a little number slider here and that will help us determine how many layers we want to appear in the render. So for example, I may construct this shader that has four or five different layers, but if I just want to evaluate layer up to say layer three, I can set this number to three and it will ignore anything higher than three and just show me those layers. So that's a convenient setting that we can use. The, um, the color mix node does not have its own shading group. So what I'm going to do is now substitute that um, for this uh, reflect node. I'll drag the color mix node down here and we know that anything that's mixed in here now will be associated with this um, uh, with this surface in the shader. So I'll take my reflect node and I'll drag that down and I'll make that the color base. Now when I render um, I'm not going to see anything. It's going to turn black and that's because I have my uh, number set to 2 and my color 0 and color 1 are black and my weight is set to 1. So what I'm really seeing is color 1 here which is totally black and that's 100 percent weight. So what I can do here just to see that is I can drop this number down to 1 and then take my weight and uh, drop that down to, uh, to 0. And that should show me, uh, let's make this an add. That should show me uh, my reflect node with nothing on top of it. I'm not giving any weight then to the, um, uh, to the layers on top. So when I select my color mix node and I click on the inputs and outputs, uh, this is what um, what this shader tree looks like so far. And it's important to uh, to try to make sure that uh, uh, that you stay organized and neat. Otherwise, your uh, your hyper shade is going to be kind of a mess. This is the reflectivity section here. It's my ramp with the sample air info. This is my uh, input section, which controls the diffuse uh, and the specular highlight. This is my reflection node, and then that feeds into my color, uh, my color mix. So uh, it's not too complicated. Uh, the next layer that I want to create here is going to be the label. So rather than have a Cook Torrance material, I want to have a little bit simpler, shiny, sort of uh, glossy paper look. So for that, I'm going to create a, uh, an MIB uh, Fong material. So it's the MIB Illum Fong. And I can just grab this and I'll drop it down onto color zero. Once the Fong is mapped to um, color zero of my color mix node. Um, I want my number here to be 1, my weight 0 is 1, and my mode is a blend. And you'll see that all I see now on the surface of my can is the, um, uh, is the, the Fong material. There's no um, broken up uh, refractive index on the torrents. There's no, lay there's no uh, uh, reflection or anything. All that is happening underneath this Fong. 
So I want to put the label on here. So in order to do that, I'll go into my Maya section. I'll select my 2D textures, uh, and I'll select a file texture. Uh, in order to do this, I'm going to right-click, create this as a projection, and that's going to bring up uh, my uh, standard uh, 2D file projection node. Um, the slide, the, the projection node uh, wants to be a, um, a, a cylindrical projection because I'm projecting it onto a cylinder. I'll take my placement uh, matrix here and just uh, uh, scale that up so that I'm going around the can here. And I'll, um, I'll just move it up and place it uh, accordingly. So wherever this, uh, wherever this green um, little uh, matrix or uh, placement indicator is is what the extent of my label is going to be. Um, the label I've already pre-made that so within my file texture I can just go into the uh, the file lister here it'll bring me my source images and I'll select the uh, the can label. Um, I have a, a PNG file and I have a JPEG file it doesn't really matter which one I use so I'll uh, select that and uh, that's my image that's now projected onto this projection node. Uh, one thing that we want to notice, though, is that the U angle of my projection node is 180 degrees. And what that means is that my label is only going to uh, map around uh, halfway around my can. Uh, once it hits that halfway point, um, it's going to repeat. So I'll get the same label on the front and the back. I don't really want that. So I'll take my, um, my U angle and I'll increase that. I could go as high as uh, 360 degrees, um, but I'm going to go to maybe uh, uh, 340. Okay. Now this doesn't update right away. Uh, it just needs to be refreshed. As soon as I click on it, it refreshes. And you can see that this stops short of uh, connecting back on itself. So the label on this can just doesn't meet all the way around in the back. When I do a render here, um, oh, I need to uh, connect this up. Now, my my um, my Fong material here. You know that we want to bring the ambient and the ambience down. Uh, we know the formula. It's the ambience times the ambient plus the diffuse plus the specular uh, is not going to add up to anything greater than one. So I just want to make sure that these values are low enough. So my diffuse is uh, 0.52. My specular is 0.365, so I'm I'm under under one, so I can you know adjust this a little bit later. But um, uh, what I'll do then is take this file texture here and I'll um, map that to the diffuse attribute here. So the diffuse now is going to um, reflect this uh, this color. Now notice that uh, my label here. Uh, is bounded by these two lines, and that's what is indicated by my projection, uh, my cylindrical projection um, um, object here. And what's happening here is that my label is repeating vertically on both directions. So I'll select my uh, my file texture placement node. I have a wrap U and a wrap V, so I want to turn those off. And now my uh, my label will not repeat. What I see underneath here is not the um, the Cook Torrance shader. It's not the reflection shader. Uh, it's the default color underneath the um, underneath the label. So that's the first step in getting this label um, together. So the next thing that I want to do is to drop out this area of my Fong material that is above and below my label. So really what I want to do is create a black and white version of this label that's exactly in the same position and apply that to the weight attribute of this, um, this um, layer zero here and that will create a transparency along here that I can see through to the reflective Cook Torrance shader. So, um, looking at my um, looking at my shading network, uh, just to try to keep organized, that's the bottom layer right there. This is the uh, 
the Cook Torrance uh, mapped to the uh, reflection. So I don't really want to deal with that so much. So I'm just going to select this Fong material and show my input and output connections there. You can see that my label now is projected onto the diffuse attribute here, and that is mapped to my color mix uh, layer zero. So um, since I want this to be mapped exactly in the same way, um, I'm going to um, duplicate this projection node uh, while keeping its um, uh, connection to its, its own placement there. And then I'll duplicate the slide, keeping its, um, its connection to the placement. I'll select the projection node. Uh, I'll go to Edit, and I'll say Duplicate uh, with its connections to the network. And that's going to duplicate the upstream connections. So that keeps it connected to both the uh, the placement node and the slide. I don't want it to be connected to the slide. So what I'll do is I'll duplicate the slide with um, with its connections to the network. That gives me a secondary let's just pull this around here like this. That's going to give me a secondary um, uh, image here, which I can then replace. I'll just map that onto this second, uh, the second projection node. So down here, this lower section is the color. It's controlled by these two placement nodes. This one here is going to be the alpha channel, and uh, and that's controlled by this projection. So. Uh, this is a little bit different than Maya transparency. We're going to be connecting the alpha. So uh, when you're dealing with alpha, it's actually the opposite of transparency. Black is transparent and white is uh, opaque. So uh, uh, in order to create that, I'm going to take this file texture. I'm going to make the default color black. And that's going to make this area right here black or transparent. Uh, my color gain is also going to be black, and that's going to eliminate any of the RGB values um, on, on the label. It's just going to bring them all the way down to zero. And then I'll take the color offset, and I'll bring that up to white. And what that will do is add value to where this label is. So when I add white to black, I end up with white. So I'll have a black background and a white label placed exactly the same because I use the same placement nodes. I'll come back to my color mix node, and I want my projection here to be mapped to the weight. So I'll drag this down to the weight. Maya doesn't really know what kind of a connection I want to make, so it brings up the connection editor. And in this case, I want to take the out alpha of that map, and I'll map that to weight 0. My mode here is going to be a mix. Uh, a mix uh, is similar to an over uh, in Photoshop. So this will just give me one right on top of the next. And when I render this out, uh, you'll see that I can now see my reflections, uh, my nice reflective shader with my nice um, uh, uh, Cook Torrance specular highlight, and the label is right on top with the Fong specular. So let's see if we can. Um, uh, let's see if we can render this so that we can see the, the highlights a little bit better. Yeah, this is good. So you can see that, uh, that over here on my Cook Torrance, I've got this specular highlight. This is turning a little bit blue, and then my Fong has a much more diffuse highlight showing the shininess, the different material of this, uh, of this paint label. So that's, that's step number two. And uh, I, can, um, I can add a dirt layer to this in the same way that we've added dirt uh, in the past. Um, I can take a, um, uh, well, for example, a 2D fractal. And I know that I just want to darken this label by whatever the values of this fractal are. So I can just uh, uh, drag the fractal onto the color gain attribute. It'll multiply all those colors down. And you can see that, uh, that that's giving me this... Um, this dirty, uh, dirty look right there. So I can play around with that a little bit. Um, you know, I can take the amplitude down, and I can uh, spread this out a little bit so that, uh, you know, I stretch the fractal so that it covers an area that's 
that's five times as big. And then when I render this, um, you can see I just get the little bit of dirt on there, but a really nice shiny can. So again, I can go back and I can adjust these later. So that then uh, is how we do our second layer, uh, which numerically is called layer zero. The next layer that we want to put on here is the paint. And if you recall, the paint has a, uh, a bump mat on it so that it gives it a little bit of texture. So if you're familiar with working with Maya, uh, the order of events is you'll create the shader and then you add the bump map to the shader. In this case, we have to think ahead a little bit. We want to put the bump map on first and then we put the shader on on top of that. So the bump actually uh, exists underneath the shader. So the first thing I want to do is just get organized a little bit. I'll select my color mix node and I'll just click on the inputs. And this is going to show me my shading network so far. Um, up here this section is the Cook Torrance with the reflection and then this right down here is the um, is the label with the transparency and now the third one that I want to put on there is going to be the uh, the bump uh, with the paint and the paint's transparency. Uh, I want to um, do a little bit of house cleaning here. It's really important to stay organized. You can start to see that I've got a lot of nodes building up in my hypershade and it's pretty easy to get lost. So when I put the, uh, the, the dripping paint on here, I'm going to want to use another uh, 3D paint texture. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, another 3D placement texture. So um, I'm going to hide this one. This one is um, uh, it's identified by this 3D placement node right here. And in the uh, attribute editor for that 3D placement node, uh, under the display section, I have a visibility checkbox. So I can just turn that off so that um, I don't have to look at it um, and I won't get confused by my bump map. So uh, the bump map is going to be placed uh, just like uh, the, uh, the label map with a projected file texture. So I'll right click on my 2D uh, textures, I'll create as a projection, and uh, I'll just bring this down. Uh, I'll bring this down here so that I have a place to, to, um, to play with it here. I've got the projection node, I've got the placement node there, and I've got this uh, um, 2D file texture where I can put the, uh, the bump map. So just to get started, I'll select my projection. I'll turn that also into a cylindrical projection. This one, I want my U angle to be 360. I want that to go all the way around. And I'll select my placement um, object here. I'll scale it up. and. Uh, just drag that up so that it covers. Now I want that to um, to go over the top here. I'm not so concerned with the bottom. Um, you know, I want those drips to go about halfway down the can, and you know they'll stop here. It'll repeat, but I can change the um, uh, the wrap uh, U and V, so that's not going to matter. Now I want this to be a bump map, so. Um, in my uh, utilities section, I can come down here and select a bump 3D. Now you have a choice between a bump 2D and a bump 3D. The bump 3D is for all of your 3D textures and all of your projections. So um, I want to use this and I'll just drag the projection onto there and connect that to the default. And Maya knows exactly what I want to do. However, Mental Ray does not know how to interpret a Maya bump map. At least this uh, color mix node doesn't know how to do that. So, in order to um, in order to make, to translate it so that this node will understand it, I need to use um, a node that um, uh, that Mental Ray understands. This is going to be in the materials section, and it's one of the subsurface scattering uh, um, nodes. The node that we want is an MISSS set normal. So the MISSS 
stands for the mental images subsurface scattering. And what we'll do, this, this node has two attributes here. It has a normal vector, which has three channels. And then it has a space, a tangent space right here, which is just set to one. All we really need to do is take this bump node and drag it down and map it to the normal vector. And that's going to create that translation for me. I'll bring this uh, into the, um, uh, the color mix node and I'll drop this down onto uh, color one. So that is the underlying bump map for my next, uh, for my next node placement. Um, the bump map is going to be described by a file texture that I use here and that's going to be my uh, drips blur and the drips blur is um, is just a uh, a black and white map here that has these uh, these paint drips in in them, and I used a um, a Gaussian blur around the edge just to give it a little bit of softness around the edge. We're not going to see anything with this yet. Uh, so I'm not going to do any kind of a render, but what I want to do is add now um, another layer here. I've got um, uh, my base layer is the Cook Torrance with the reflectivity. My uh, layer 0 is the label. My layer 1 is now the bump node. So I'll take a um, uh, another uh, material and put that on as uh, color 2, which will be the, the, uh, the dripping paint. So um, I'll just use a Fong for now. I mean, you can use what you like, but uh, Fong has a nice little specular highlight here. I'll turn down the ambience in the ambient, and uh, I'll just give myself a nice high exponent so I have a nice shiny Fong right there. I'll take the diffuse color here, and um, let's just say we want some blue paint dripping here. So um, the, um, the main value here, this, the value attribute here, is going to be what determines um, you know, the numeric uh, values here. So if my, my, the value of my blue is a 0.7, then my specular really needs to be a 0.3 or less. So that's a, now it's a physically accurate um, shader here. So I'll drag that on to uh, my color 2. With the blue fong now applied to color 2, uh, I'll slide up here. And you know if I do a render, I won't see anything there uh, because I'm not, I haven't said that I want to incorporate that in my composite. So right now, my number is set to 1, which is only giving me color 0. Color 1 is the bump map, so that's two layers. And then color two is the um, is the blue fong, and that's going to be my uh, my third layer. So when I set my number to three, um, what I'll have now is this complete drippy paint down here. Um, and you can see this little line here that corresponds to the bottom of my um, of my texture placement, and then my texture starts to repeat here. So I can take this texture placement node and I'll drag it down just a little bit. Maybe I'll stretch it a little bit and pull it down, and uh, so I can just uh, I can play around with this and get this to, uh, uh, to 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 show these drips just the way that I want them. I can also take the wrap of my bump map there and I can turn that off. So even if um, if my texture placement uh, is um, you know, if it stops halfway down the can there, um, that shouldn't really matter. Um, I won't see the, um, uh, the bump there. Um, I'm seeing a little bit of a line there, and that's because um, the black of my bump map is ending right there, and I'm seeing the, uh, the gray of uh, the default color. So if I want to get rid of that line, I have to take that default color and make that black. Uh, and then that'll just continue the black uh, right underneath there. It'll keep a little consistency in the bump. So uh, the next thing that I want to do then is, um, uh, well, let's clean up a little bit. So I'll take my 
uh, my nor set normal and my fong here, and I'll show my input and output connections. So I can just see that section now of my um, of my shader tree. And what I want is the same projection that is controlling the bump map uh, to control the um, the transparency here or the weight of uh, of this fong. So that's going to be my weight number two. So just like I did before, I'll take the, uh, the projection node and I'll duplicate that uh, with its connections to the network and that's going to duplicate this uh, with both the, uh, the image here and the placement node. Well, I have another image that doesn't have that blurred edge, so that'll give me a, a more crisp edge to the transparency that I'd like to use. So I'll, um, I'll select this file here and I'll duplicate that one uh, with its connections to the network, and that duplicates the slide and keeps, it, um, keeps the placement node uh, exactly the same. I'll put this on the image here, and I'll replace that file with uh, my drips file that's not blurred, which is just the drips. So this one here just has the drips with a nice crisp hard edge, black and white. Uh, just like I did with the other node then, I'm going to take this projection here, um, and I'll map that to uh, my weight number two. and I get the connection editor and I want to map the um, out alpha uh, to the weight 2. So once that's mapped to the uh, the weight number 2 uh, then I want to make a little adjustment in my compositing flags. Uh, the, um, the bump map itself which is um, uh, which is um, layer or uh, color one, I want that to be an add and then uh, the, uh, the transparency map, uh, this, this file right here, I want that to be a mix. And when I set those compositing flags like that, what I'll end up with is this nice, um, uh, this nice uh, triple shader with the nice reflections there on the bottom, uh, the dirt map on the label and the middle layer, and then the, uh, uh, the bump map here uh, along with the blue. Shader. So that's really about it. Um, I can play around with that a little bit. Um, uh, if I take the um, the bump map section, which is this right here, um, I can take my file number eight and I can map something to the color gain. So uh, if I take a um, uh, let's take a well, we just take a fractal for now. Um, that's always a nice one to to play around with. So um, I'll map the fractal to the color gain. And uh, so this is this is what it looks like without it. And uh, let's save that and I'll play, you know, place that with it. And now you can see that I've got that that uh, real rough fractal uh, bump map on top of uh, the drips bump map. So you know again just like I did before I can take the amplitude down to maybe lessen the effect of that. And then um, I can uh, take the spread of that and spread it out a little bit. So I'll just go, you know, maybe five by five, like I did with the other with the other piece. Let's just come in a little closer here, and uh, and do a render with this. Uh, so now you can see I've got that nice uh, edge right there, and the fractal is giving a little bit of texture to this to this thing, and those drips are uh, are bumpy. So once I've done that, um, then I can go back to my various layers. Let's just show the inputs of that color mix node. Um, I'll find uh, this section right here is my reflection. And uh, so, um, you know, with the reflection, one of the things that I uh, that I can do if this if this if I feel like this reflection is uh, is too strong right there, I can. Um, uh, I can replace that in the IBL node. So what I've done, um, you know, prior to this was um, I took some of these uh, reflection maps and um, I blurred them. So here's one right here, 
that's you know this is this is what the original reflection map looks like and I just blurred it in a few stages there in, in Photoshop so I've got a pretty good blurred version of this there so I'll just set that one on there and uh, and now let's, uh, let's save this and I'll go ahead and, and do another render and that makes the, the can the mat of the can look a little bit more um, uh, more diffuse of course it blurs the background but uh, um, you know, that's, that's really it.